Welcome to Oddly Real. I'm Nem Stefanovic. We live in a radioactive universe. The planet Earth is radioactive. Our solar system is radioactive. And everything beyond as well. Even you and I are radioactive. Radiation is everywhere. Some kinds of radiation can harm you, while other kinds do not. Note that those same harmful radiations, when applied appropriately, instead become cures. The human body has its own nuances on how it is affected by radiation. Our bodies can repair certain radiation-induced damages, while other parts of our body are much more sensitive to such exposures. In this episode, we're going to talk about radiation as a whole, with examples of how it impacts us as human beings. This might come as a surprise, but we are exposed to radiation all the time from multiple sources. We can break down this exposure into two main categories, background radiation and human-made sources. In general, background radiation and human-made sources each contribute one half of our total annual radiation exposure. When we say background radiation, we mean naturally occurring sources of radiation from the Earth and outer space. Our most significant exposure to radiation from background sources is from the Earth itself. For example, a substance called radon-222 accounts for two-thirds of our annual background radiation absorption by our bodies. It's distributed everywhere across the Earth, although certain areas may have more or less concentrations. Radon-222 is an invisible, odorless gas that is harmful if inhaled. It can be present in poorly ventilated basements, but it can also enter groundwater. If it's present in water supplies, taking a hot shower where there's lots of water in the form of steam will increase the likelihood of exposure. There are other radioactive elements that are present in the Earth's crust, like uranium, that will also contribute to this type of naturally occurring background radiation exposure. We are also constantly being exposed to radiation from cosmic sources outside of the Earth. The Sun itself produces a wide spectrum of electromagnetic radiation that travels to Earth. The Sun will also produce spontaneous solar flares. These yield high-energy electromagnetic radiation, like X-rays and gamma rays, as well as high-energy charged particles like protons and electrons. There are numerous other sources of high-energy radiation emanating from the universe as a whole. For example, supernovas are the violent explosions of stars that eject enormous amounts of mass and release very high-energy radiation. The other part of our radiation exposure comes from human-made sources. In this case, 80% of the exposures come from medical procedures to conduct x-rays of body parts, CT scans, thyroid scans, PET scans, and liver, spleen, and bone scans. The roughly 20% remaining comes from a variety of sources like electronic screens, smoke detectors, heart pacemakers, and even porcelain teeth. Depending on the person as well, you might get exposure to UV light from using a tanning bed. Of note is that 1% of that figure comes from the exposure from the nuclear fuel cycle, from mining, transportation, nuclear fuel fission, and waste management. But what exactly is radiation? There are multiple types, but it helps to categorize the radiation as either ionizing or non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation is more powerful and it can alter atomic structures and chemicals in cells. Thus, it can be harmful and cause cancer, but alternatively, it can also be useful enough to be used to cure cancer. Non-ionizing radiation is significantly less powerful and does little to no harm with the exception of UV rays. One type of radiation is electromagnetic. This includes the entire electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves to visible light to X-rays and gamma rays. For context, X-rays possess about 10 million times more energy than radio waves, which is why X-rays can be harmful, but radio waves are not. Another type of radiation comes from energetic particle emissions. These particles can be produced in many different ways, such as from the nuclear decay of an atom, 
or an interstellar event like a supernova, or human-made events like particle collisions in particle accelerators. We can classify the common particle-based emissions. Electron emissions are known as beta particles. A heavier particle emission consisting of two protons and two neutrons, which is a helium nucleus, is called an alpha particle. Lastly, there are also neutron emissions. Beta particles are the least dangerous type of particle emission for humans. They are lighter particles and aren't able to penetrate deeply into human tissues. They don't transfer much energy as part of their absorption. Beta particle emissions are shielded with as little as a layer of clothing or materials such as thin sheets of aluminum. Alpha particles pose more of an intermediate danger to us. They are more massive particles and can transfer more energy. However, they don't tend to penetrate very deeply into tissues. The energy tends to be transferred at surface layers. This type of radiation can be shielded using materials like a single sheet of paper. Neutron radiation is the most dangerous type of particle here. They can possess a lot of energy and tend to penetrate deeply into the body. In order to shield this kind of radiation, you have to use concrete or have water that could be meters deep. Note that the electromagnetic spectrum ranges from harmless, low-energy radio waves to dangerous, high-energy gamma rays. This radiation, like X-rays and gamma rays, can also be shielded against. However, this shielding requires meters of concrete or centimeters of lead. When waves or particles strike matter, energy can be transferred. This energy transfer is what we'd consider to be a dose of radiation. And the larger the energy transfer, the larger the dose. For human beings, it also depends on where the particle does its damage. For example, an alpha particle emanating from inhaled radon gas particles does damage to tissues in the lungs, which can lead to lung cancer. UV exposure to our skin can result in damage and mutations in the DNA of those cells. Normally, our body is able to repair this damage, but on occasion, if it can't, it will result in the cell malfunctioning, and that can lead to skin cancer. We can measure the amount of radiation emission by counting the number of spontaneous decays of unstable radioactive atoms per second. This yields the radiation measurement of Becquerel's. But the radioactive emission rate is not the only factor that is relevant to us as human beings. We want to know how much radioactivity is being deposited into our bodies as a dose. Instead, another unit of measure called grays determines the amount of energy deposited into a material to produce a dose of radiation. Lastly, grays can be transformed into a unit called sieverts which is modified to calculate the risk of harm from radiation in humans. If there's one unit to remember that's most important for radiation dose, it's sieverts. For the US population, people on average will receive an annual dose of radiation equal to approximately 6.2 millisieverts. Humans absorb radiation differently depending on the type of radiation, the radiation dosage into the tissues, and the susceptibility of the tissues to radiation-induced damage. For example, bone marrow, skin, and gastrointestinal tract cells are very sensitive to radiation damage, with one factor being that they divide more frequently. Other cells, like the heart, liver, and brain cells, are more resistant, and they tend to have less frequent cell division. Recall that we said that radiation is everywhere. It's in our food, water, and even in our own bodies. Most of the radiation is harmless. For example, potassium-40 is found naturally in slightly higher concentrations in bananas. Eating one banana produces a 0.1 microsievert dose of radiation. So you'd need to eat 100 bananas to get the same amount of radiation exposure that you'd normally get on any day from normal background radiation sources. Potassium-40 is taken up more by muscle cells than by other types of cells. So having more muscle within your body will result in more potassium-40. Our bodies also contain radioactive elements like cesium-137 
that are not from natural sources. These tend to be produced from nuclear fission. Every second, we are emitting radiation from the decay of thousands of these radioactive atoms within our bodies. The first atomic bomb was detonated on July 16, 1945 in New Mexico. This resulted in the brightest light ever seen up to that time, as well as the creation of radioactive elements like cesium-137, iodine-131, and strontium-90, which didn't exist in nature outside of human laboratories. For months after the detonation, radioactive elements spread around the world and became part of every human body. Some of the elements released won't decay for thousands of years, so children for generations to come will have these elements in their bodies as well. There were around 450 other atmospheric nuclear tests conducted by the US, Soviet Union, Britain, France, and China from 1945 to 1980. Interestingly, steel that was produced prior to 1945 is less radioactive than steel that's produced after 1945. So pre-1945 steel is more desirable for use in radiation shielding equipment. Sometimes we have to weigh the risk of exposure to radiation to the benefit it can bring. For example, a CT angiogram scan of the heart exposes an individual to one-tenth of the amount of radiation exposure received by the average Hiroshima atomic bomb survivor. However, the risk of having an imminent heart attack resulting in death could outweigh that cost. Also, someone that has six PET scans for the purpose of cancer detection will have the same radiation exposure as an atomic bomb survivor. There's a lot of controversy around exact correlations between radiation exposure and health issues such as cancer rates. I won't go into all the details, so I'm just going to mention a couple of considerations. Many scientists will suggest that there's a threshold, somewhere between 50 millisieverts and 100 millisieverts, of dosage which, if exceeded, results in a strong linear correlation with cancer risk. So the higher the dosage above the threshold, the higher the cancer risk. But there is much more disagreement and some conflicting evidence about the risks of cancer from lower doses. Much of our data about radiation exposure comes from atomic bomb survivors or a situation of radiation exposure from medical treatments. It's not as clear what the adverse effects of low radiation doses are over longer periods of exposure. But despite the debate, many scientists will agree that we can assume that even low doses are potentially harmful. The radioactivity of substances have lifetimes that are determined using half-life measurements. The half-life of a radioactive substance is defined as the amount of time it takes for half of the atoms to decay. If you wait 10 half-lives, then only one thousandth of the atoms will be left. For example, iodine-131 has a half-life of about 8 days, meaning in 80 days, 99.9% .9 of the atoms will have decayed into the stable xenon-131 element, which is harmless. The human body also has a biological half-life for materials, whether they're radioactive or not. This is the time it takes to remove half of any material that's present in the body. The biological half-life depends on the physical and chemical properties of the material in question. For example, xenon-131 can pass through the body without harm or issue. However, strontium-90 can be absorbed into bones since the body doesn't distinguish it from calcium. We can take a look at a very well-known example of radioactive material absorption of iodine-131 into the human body. The human body uses the thyroid gland found below the Adam's apple for metabolic regulation in the body. Iodine-127 is a critical element in that process. However, iodine-131, which is radioactive and harmful, is not distinguishable from iodine-127 by the body. So when there's radioactive contamination in an area, iodine-131 can land on grass or leafy greens or in water. This food or water can be consumed by people or animals. Cows will eat the grass and the contaminants will enter their milk. 
If a human body is fully saturated with enough iodine-127, then it won't readily absorb the iodine-131. But if deficient, then the body will absorb the iodine-131. Once in the thyroid, the ionizing radiation that emanates from iodine-131 can mutate the DNA of cells in the thyroid, which can lead to cancer. Preventions include avoiding consuming vegetables and dairy products from contaminated areas, as well as taking iodine tablets of iodine-127 before exposure to iodine-131. After 80 days, the iodine-131 contaminants in the area will have decayed to harmless xenon-131. Thank you for watching this episode. I hope you learned something new. Remember, oddly real, really interesting.